Greetings, everybody, and welcome to This Is Revolution. My name is Jean Vagelon, in for Jason Miles on this very special White Guy Wednesday, where we're teaming up uh, with Brown Vlog to talk about some theoretical issues. But of course, uh, because it's White Guy Wednesday, I will be joined, of course, by my favorite friend. Uh, he's going to be saying the 14 words for us all later on this evening, which is uh, very appropriate for the topic we're talking about today. Everyone's favorite uh, diversity pick, right? Exactly. Deep the State Cuba. Deep State Cuba. Welcome, Cuba. We're going to be talking about um, Eric Hobsbawm tonight. And we're going to be talking about the invention of One of your people. One of my people. Oh, he's a Brit, right? He's a Brit. But he's also Jewish. Just like C. Derek Vaughn. So uh, he's... So you can both claim credit. Yeah. Uh, also, isn't he from... Certain God. regions of Ger isn't his mother's family from certain regions of Germany or the Austro Hungarian Empire, which is basically Poland, <laughs> <laughs> Greater Poland, as Greater like Poland, which is basically Greater Poland. So he's a common inheritance, but as a good universalist, of course, Eric Hobsbawm uh, belongs to us all, belongs to us all. In fact, uh, when I was preparing for this episode, uh, I checked on YouTube to see if there were like any interviews with him and i got a good news night interview with him from uh 2002 where uh jeremy paxman the well-known british uh, news interviewer chappy is basically trying to get him to say come on you were wrong don't you feel like you're wrong about being supported against communism it's never worked like how do you feel about america and and Hobbes was like, Meh, I'm not. Uh, I don't feel bad about supporting anti-imperialism and the rich, the poor against the rich, and really giving it back to Paxman. It was good to see. Stuck to his guns, and um, and also um, told people to give up on the Leninist party model because he says it doesn't matter anymore. He said it used to be good, but that historical phase has passed. But he was still quite sprightly in 2002. But before we begin, who was Eric Hobsbawm? Well, he is a historian. Uh, he was born in Austria, I believe, uh, to an English uh, Jew uh, English father and a uh, European mother. And uh, they were Jewish people, and they spent their early times in Germany. He was born in Egypt. Oh, he was born in e he was born in Alexandria, right? Yep. Uh, yep but his mother's family was austrian is that correct i do believe so yeah yeah and so he spent his childhood in vienna and in berlin and his childhood was like witnessing some very dark episodes of history yeah i mean he was born in 1917 he almost lived to be 100. <laughs> he was still writing books into the aught teens yeah so. he, he he was he was he was keeping it real much respect to Eric Hobsbawm, and of course, he's very well known uh, for his series, you know, Age of Revolution, Age of Capital, Age of Empire, and then Age of Extremes. This kind of history of the world, and you know, he's written a history of jazz, which is quite influential. He's like a very accomplished historian who wrote a good book on bandits as well uh, but uh, and also wrote a big book on nationalism uh, nations and nationalism but uh, one of his most influential contributions to you know theory as it were like historical theory uh, i guess political science sociology was this idea of the invention of tradition which is basically a theoretical framework that he that um he worked sets out with up terence a, ranger right yeah terence ranger it sets up a collection of essays written by different historians on different topics but around this same theme uh that is the invention of tradition and so people can understand what he was talking about uh it 
in, in the introduction to invention of tradition, he defines that an invented tradition is taken to mean a set of practices normally governed by overt or tacit accepted rules and of a ritual or symbolic nature which seeks to inculcate certain values and norms of behavior by repetition, which will ultimately, uh, which automatically implies continuity uh, with the past. In fact, where possible, they normally uh, accept to establish continuity with a suitable historical past. So what it's talking about here is this this idea of particular rites and rituals that are engaged in public activities, as it were, that are engaged in, uh, supported by institutions, most notably the nation state, to inculcate a kind of set of values. That's different from, uh, he differentiates it from things like custom and routine, custom being the idea there's just something, somebody fulfills a role in a society like a judge is a judge. And a routine where there's a set of practices that may develop traditions, but they're largely technically orientated. So uh, he looks at this concept of the invented tradition and looks at what they're used to create and how they function in society. And he looks at how they come to define, uh, uh, you know, group membership, how they come to legitimize hierarchy and how in many ways they all come together uh, in the nation state which is a kind of klug of invented traditions to you know serve to create this concept of nations and nationalism and the a world of nations and a world of nation states van kuba would you think would you say that's a fair assessment of what the invention of tradition is and uh yes and i think that um, he draws a very useful distinction between custom and tradition and between the concept of invented tradition and traditional society. Mm -hmm. And that might be a useful line to draw. Um, he uses custom to describe things like living tradition, where um, the in particular institutions or the ways of doing things are embedded in a long um, his gradual historical evolution without uh, a major disruption, right? The reason that you do things a particular way is because this is what you've inherited, but because it's practical and in daily use, um, it's constantly changing and evolving. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why traditional societies don't have invented traditions. Instead, they have living customs. Um, right. And it's precisely at this historical moment with the emergence of modernity and the nation state as as a form that you get invented tradition. It's what sets us apart from traditional societies rather than being something that's that's part of them. And these traditions are invented precisely at a time in which disruption is taking place or the uh, or rather there's a kind of increase in the tempo of destruction and change in society and it's at precisely this moment that there is an explosion in invented tradition so it is often these invented traditions are often often plastering over or coming into being at times of uh, rapid change and modernization uh, uh, in a way that for example political power seeks to legitimize itself by appeals to the past appeals to continuity uh so it's also a way of foregrounding one potential identity over another yeah uh, yes and especially and separating those identities too so for example making sure like the northern english and the lower scottish do not over identify with each other and neither and the highlands identifies with neither like in these traditions being codified and and in many cases invented by colonial power, I mean, like explicitly colonial powers, which are kind of paradoxically instantiating nationalism, right? Um, it it separates you out. It also it also layers out who's like you said, who's on the top and the bottom of the of of these hierarchy statuses, but it also sets up uh, all kinds of administrative districts. Uh, we use this book a lot when I lived in Korea and worked at the Korean University about how many of Korean traditions were actually invented by the Japanese. Um, 
and explicitly invented by the Japanese and retrojected into Korea's past, uh, you know, in the in the Japanese imperial period. And so That's similarly, um, mm -hmm. most central most Ashkenazi Jewish surnames um, were the invention of the Prussian state. Right. The uh, if there were, you know, nobody there's no um, Norman Finkelstein in the Bible, right? That's not one of the tribes of Asher or something. Um, it had to do with a bureaucratic form uh, that was imposed on subjects within a particular political space for bureaucratic reasons. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, that is part of this kind of bureaucrat bureaucratization of power. And, you know, the invention of tradition is an expression of that a desire to create these these kind of uh traditions that serve these uh functions in terms of defining group identity and reifying uh hierarchies naturalizing hierarchies i mean there's no this uh, better display of this uh than the coronation that we just saw take place in london where you have all this pomp and ceremony which seems like tradition, but a lot of it is invented in the late 19th century as part of a new paraphernalia of royal pageantry, linking the crown to the nation, uh, uh, you know, trying to build this kind of British uh, nationalism in which the monarchy becomes this invented tradition in and of itself, that it is definitional about the british identity but I, it's one i can't decide if the 19th century victorian traditionalists were the forerunners of modern cosplay or modern civil war reenactment both both yeah both. Both. I, I mean i was actually looking at uh the the royal regalia and i was like oh that purple looks like it's from from spirit the halloween store um uh because i it, you know bright purple silk looks like nylon yeah. um, but it, it it's 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 such an interesting thing that you have these these ancient traditions at most usually go back to queen victoria and another one that we all know maybe we don't all know is the white wedding dress is a victorian thing too a lot of our ancient wedding traditions uh, if you're if you're in uh, an English speaking Christian culture are literally 150 years old. So and what's interesting, too, is in this um, in the case of a pushback against precisely the 19th century invention of tradition over older, um, more Celtic, less Anglo um, folkways, you have the reinvention of tradition by irish americans or by sort of well, other that's, ultra that's the perfect types. that's the perfect example of an invented tradition because uh, there couldn't even be cases where a tradition might actually be an old tradition but what's key about its invention is like the way that it is mobilized in a new way so you might have an old ritual or an old cis symbol that is imbued with a new meaning uh, and, uh, and also, um, sometimes, especially in the, I can't help but think of the, the entire linguistic history of modern Czech, right? Uh, um, the absorption of Bohemia and Moravia by uh, the Austrian Habsburgs was so early and so complete that um, by the 19th century revival of Slavic nationalism, uh, there were no urban Czech speakers. There were no courses taught in the Czech language. Um, it survived only in a few isolated uh, rural uh, enclaves. And in this case, an entire an entire language was invented, right? It was revived, um, standardized, and uh, missing vocabulary filled in with loan words from Polish or... Um, usually Polish, but sometimes other languages, not German. Um, and Explicitly not German. Yeah, exactly, because <laughs> that's the whole point, right? And um, then it becomes the basis 
right? One of the, the foundational elements of a nationalist project. Yeah, that's an interesting point with the Czech language because most people tend to think that the only language that has been revived, uh, and by revived we mean mostly invented, um, is Hebrew, modern Hebrew. If, if you know anything about biblical Hebrew, modern Hebrew is both alike and very different. Um, if you if you read modern Hebrew and read it back into the Bible, it's actually going to confuse you. Uh, but and it, there's a lot of loan words from Arabic and Aramaic and 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 whatever. And you, and again, well, you know what it doesn't have in it is Yiddish and Ladino, um, because you know we're not going to speak in these dirty Jewish hybrid languages. And that that one's obvious and well documented. And um, well, it's the, always to an extent with. Uh, in the 19th century, in terms of language, most languages outside of you know, the core countries of the Industrial Revolution, like Britain, France, Germany, Spain, maybe, most other places ha had some kind of linguistic reform or linguistic reforms movements to modernize the use of language. For example, like the importation of punctuation and things like that uh, changes in alphabet too. yeah changes in alphabet, in alphabet. Uh, the creation of neologisms certainly i think linguistic standardization is definitely a parallel to the what what's going on with invention of tradition where you know you may have more or less of a pre-existing material to work with and establish continuity but even where continuity exists, it's a kind of false continuity because it's uh, the use of these uh, traditions are uh, have a completely so different social meaning from what they did in the past. A good yeah. example is the chapter in in the in this volume by uh, Hugh Trevor, Trevor Roper. Roper about mm -hmm. Scotland and how you know the Highlands. The, the Highland people and the Highland clothing was completely, you know, distinct from the state bearing lowland Scottish uh, culture. In fact, they were Irish and they were seen as Irish completely separate. But over the courses of the crisis, uh, the economic and political uh, crises in, in the British Isles, these parochial, marginal clothings like tartan was suddenly transformed into the national dress and became the tradition uh, of the country even though it was in the past it was worn repeatedly worn it was part of the customs of the people who had who wore that clothes but it was so that they could hide why they did cattle wrestling but it was completely transformed in the context of the uh, 18th and 19th century yeah, most, well, i mean to to tie it back to that kind of sartorial invention think of the cowboy hat in the states mm -hmm. which is um invented by stetson who's a new yorker who gets uh, uh tuberculosis gets in out west invents the hat if you actually know the origins of that hat though and have ever hung out in northern mexico it actually predates the stetson to in a northern mexican hat uh, that whole uniform is kind of standardized in the early 20th century for Western Wild West movies. shows. Yeah, Wild West shows. Um, and it's it's debatable if anyone actually ever wore all that together. It's also uh, a lot of those pieces of clothing were either Mexican or they were freed black people who were out West. That was a lot of the early cowboys. Um, uh, and also the kit that you have, um, if you're in Wyoming, is completely different than yeah. Uh, why on earth would you? And, the, same and the, the the interesting thing about that is you have the out, you know. That's an example of it's not quite the same as some of the other traditions we're talking about here, which are deliberately adopted by the state as as like the national traditions, right? But in America, obviously, because it's like was the most advanced capitalist country in the world, it's kind of interesting that American national uh, paraphernalia, which is integrated into the uh, the culture and is seen as traditional, it's used in the American military uniforms, 
you know, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Boy Scouts. So, Boy Scouts. There's the appeal to it. Uh, it's interesting that comes from a kind of commercial need to standardize cowboy show uh, cowboy show looks and and it was appropriated uh, by the state uh, in certain contexts to give the traditional this is the traditional american outfit this is the traditional texan outfit yeah and the you can see the interplay thanks to american regional polarization of uh the invention of traditions plural sometimes in direct um dispute with one another uh, based on the relative, the level that you're looking at. I mean, one of the um, most obvious would be um, the Civil War monuments in the South, the Confederate uh, yeah. monuments. That, that was a very... perfect, perfect example. Yeah, put up in the 20s by the same company that put up the, the Union memorials in the North. In fact, some of the statues are actually identical if you actually get close to them. But for um, but what we what we you know what's interesting about uh, those as invented traditions, they they were invented to reinforce the hierarchy of Jim Crow, Southern uh, United States. So that's why it's disingenuous for people to go about oh well it's just our history. It's like no, this is an invented tradition serving an ideological purpose, which is to reinforce the the quote unquote natural hierarchy of the. United States. And it's also to select a legitimate official collective Southern um, identity out of um, different potential narratives that you could identify with. For instance, um, West Virginia sided with the Union and was fiercely anti-slave. Why not make um, those um, Southerners your folk heroes, right? Um, you can find examples of uh, different types of um, uh, narratives and different heritages that are available. Like, why stop at American Southerner, right? Why not go back to the old country or um, find find connections to something which would um, make the whole Confederate experience just a footnote, right? You're more right. than the Confederacy, but um, this cultural mobilization around this invented tradition is precisely to foreclose all of those alternatives and force um, a kind of internal referendum on... Um, I mean, the, it, some of it serves as like a, socialize, a socialization, right? Like, uh, it's not enforced in the United States, but the Pledge of Allegiance as a tradition that schools uphold uh so literally dates back to the 30s the modern version of it dates back to the eisenhower administration um like it's it's been altered to the under god was added later um ironically which is why you don't have to say it uh it's, it's actually funnily enough the original version of that pledge was written in the 20s by a socialist um but yeah, I mean that that's a highly invented tradition. But even even th you want a big one for an invented tradition. J just one one sec though, because people are asking in the chat about this. What's the difference between an invented tradition? Aren't all traditions invented? And I just want to reiterate what we criticize. <laughs> that's a criticism of this book. <laughs> and n not only that, to be fair to uh, Hobsbawm, is he distinguishes it between things like custom or uh, practices in which the ritual is incidental to the practice rather than the reason for the practice itself. For example, there may be some kind of a tea ceremony, perhaps. Now, the tea ceremony gets reinvented as an invented tradition in Japan. But there, you know, even before modernity, there was uh, an etiquette to the, the, the tea drinking ceremonies in, in, uh, in Japan. But that kind of evolved over time. It wasn't invented within a relatively short period of time. It grew out of a practice as opposed to... Uh... So, can I give you an example in the American context that will help you all? The modern traditions around Thanksgiving were not codified until the 1950s. I know we, even my grandparents seem to have like false memories of like Thanksgiving tradition going back before that. My grandparents were 
old enough to have been alive in the 20s and 30s. But the whole like pilgrim narrative as the narrative of our Thanksgiving is a specifically 50s codified tradition. There are competing versions of the Thanksgiving story all competing for the tradition that we had adopt up until the 1950s. And the Plymouth, Massachusetts one was the one that was adopted, pushed out in schools, pushed out in media uh, in the 50s and 60s. There, uh, Thanksgiving meal celebrations were actual colonial practices, but there were several. It wasn't just the, the, the Massachusetts Plymouth Bay Colony one that has been the one we've standardized and made a myth about. And, uh, if you go back to the 19th century, you will find multiple versions and multiple states claiming multiple origins for their various Thanksgiving. And the Thanksgiving holiday itself, even before that, was not codified until the Civil War as a kind of, hey, we stopped killing each other. Let's have a secular national holiday. It's specifically got to be secular because we got to get this Catholic, Catholic Protestant thing down. Like that was explicit and deliberate. So, and in the case that actually fits the Hasbon example, these were done by the state. Like, different state governments did it, and then the national government tried to codify it on it, and then there was a big national push, informally, not legally, but in, but definitely from the federal government to push out the narrative, push out this bit of history, etc., Now, if you go back and read the history, you will find bits of the 1950s, thanksgiving tradition in old history books but if that's all you're looking for you're like oh that's always been part of the tradition if you know what you're looking for you can find the alternate celebrations in the u.s so that's the distinction the the if we could refer to like the custom or the genuine tradition of thanksgiving meals in the american colonies being uh continued largely in november going back 200 years but the modern thanksgiving is a specific 1950s unification uh codification of another specific movement to come up with a secular national holiday that we could all agree upon and which provi which provides a marker for identity also provides a kind of common socialization that everybody has when you say hey you know don't fight with your uncle in the thanksgiving meal it's like the national a common trauma that everybody has so you have the yeah so <clears throat> it's an inventing traditions is like very much integral into the process of nation building itself which is all about this homogenization and, and standardization and not just nation building um and one of the examples that i was thinking in terms of uh, custom versus invested invented tradition is around prayer, right? We might not think of it because uh, I don't know about you guys, but um, I don't, I don't, it's not a big part of my life. But uh, for a lot of people, it's not an empty ritual. It um, is practiced as a, a very meaningful activity in and of itself. Now, when you pray um, in with whatever words come to you or you know your variation on an inherited um inherited prayer from your family or whatever that would be custom but the codification of prayers around pater noster ave maria and the use of the prayer those, book the that sort of thing yeah exactly that is when you get into the invention of tradition and um it can continue to serve that function for um many of the people who practice it, but there will be a lot of people that are brought in um, because, well, now you have to do it. Yeah, that's a good, that's actually a great point. Another great one that's a custom tradition is uh, for the, for the African-American black community is like jumping the broom, which is an organic tradition, but there's a lot of attempts to, to, for example, now, actually kind of reinvented as an African tradition, but all the all the evidence is it's actually a mixture of African traditions and Scotch Irish traditions. That sounds uh, about well a be, a, you know a, perhaps a, an example which is even more in people's minds is Juneteenth. Mm. Juneteenth has been celebrated 
in um, Texas, like in even Texas. in Georgia, I didn't hear about it till the nineties. Like, so the, so it, it 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 emerges as a kind of I guess a spontaneous celebration, an organic celebration in Texas to a specific historical event, but it's been appropriated by the state as a national holiday, as something that is kind of now part of a not a regional tradition, but is of an American national uh, tradition. So, th- so I think the point, though, <coughs> is I think, A, at the ch- times of change, uh, r- times of rapid change, such as the 19th and 20th century, the Industrial Revolution, a lot of these traditions are being created uh, in response to the breakdown of old uh, communal identities and ideational groups and creating is a uh, new uh, uh, form of community. I think that's, that's, a, that's a core function that they're playing to reinforce new hierarchies. To So it's not that in, inventing traditions never happened in the past, but the pace of inventing traditions picks up uh, in the modern era to justify hierarchies, make things traditional. I mean, any pageantry national holidays don't those kind of things i mean what's interesting about it is it's you know hasbaum's a marxist and it, it is almost the the whole idea that everything solid melts in the air but then gets reconstituted in modern capitalist society so you have you know um codifications and and this and that which are which you know pageantry uh, ritualization, ritual communication, that stuff is is universal. Um, we can find examples of it going all the way. I mean, if we're just limiting ourselves to like the Western or the Chinese context, you got imperial cults and whatnot that, that do this. But the specific, one of the interesting things about this and Hobbes bombs and you see this in the example and and Hasbun and Ranger's selection of essays, it is separate from religious codifications for the most part. So like like prayer, like prayer traditions are embedded traditions, and we can't really bracket them out. Like prayer books are not really a a thing that's common until basically I, I you know the Reformation. I mean, um, they're looking at this. I mean. Hobbesborn is looking at this within the context of the formation of the nation state and identities. And as to the nature of the tradition, I think the po- one of the points of the invented tradition is that the tradition may or may not be like related to a very strong older tradition or completely fabricated from the air. That's actually irrelevant because b- in both cases, they're serving fundamentally new uh, purposes to reify different types of hierarchy or things like uh, group in uh, group identity. And, uh, and it's worth uh, pointing out that sometimes attempts to invent tradition just fail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They don't always catch. Like... But I think, I think, I think Kuba is making a good point though. I think one of the good uses of, uh, invention of tradition is we can look at it not just within the context of the nation state but also the formation of reinvented uh, religious communities i mean in the study of the ottoman empire you know uh, selim derengel who's a historian has explicitly used the concept of an invented tradition to talk about how the caliphate was imbued with new political meaning in the modern era it was reinvented uh it's the caliph was a traditional title, but it came to mean a whole n- new set of things to serve new uh, ideological uh, purposes. And, and in that case, we can use invented tradition to look at the changes in modern religious identities, uh, to look at uh, university cultures where you have all these like invented traditions, which are sometimes quite self-consciously invented to create a kind of like school spirit, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, any kind of these like, group identities fraternities for example uh, sororities and the traditions that they basically invent sometimes those traditions might uh naturally evolve out of some hijinks that takes place but it becomes codified and serves as a a, a group uh, marker so it's a, it's it's a fascinating 
process of how these traditions are created and the nation state is kind of i would say like an amalgamation of different invented traditions which uh, uh all come together to form this thing we think of as a, a nation state a national identity someone yeah. in the chat said sports teams another good example of where you have a lot of invented traditions the um and i think that um it's when we talk about some of the um failures to invent tradition um those map onto failures of political projects as well um one i mean this may be uncomfortable um but for instance the use of comrade as a society-wide um salutation uh, that was an attempt at uh, inventing a tradition in the Eastern Bloc. And mm -hmm. um, when the political power that sustained it and introduced it went away, then um, right, it diminished into a vestige. I, the I was the artist. Mm -hmm. The first time someone called me comrade on the left, I laughed at them. Like, Let's because see. I'm like, that's such a Soviet kitsch thing. Why are you doing the Soviet kitsch thing? Like they're not they're not around anymore. It sounds fake. Stop it. You know, and that's the thing. Months. The irony is that um, I think we're out of the we're out of the valley. So mm -hmm. now, when somebody calls you a comrade, you know they mean it. Right. Yeah. It doesn't feel. It actually doesn't feel kitschy to me anymore. But when people started doing it again around like two thousand nine, two thousand ten, and what's up, comrade? Yeah, and you'd say, and and you just be like, "Come on!" I buddy. mean, I was just like, "What?" I'd be like, "Like seriously? Are, are did, did you just watch Red Dawn and like decide which?" But which now side like, you were on? Yeah, and now it's just like, yeah, you know, it's fine. It's 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 nice. It's non gendered in English. It works. Like, do you remember this? <laughs> Anybody remember what this was? Oh Cuba. yeah, I definitely. Um, it's the um, Iraqi flag that didn't take. Yeah, this is the Iraqi flag that they tried to bring. Yeah, somebody's wife mocked it up in Adobe. It looked way too, way too much like the Israeli flag for the Iraqis. That was the problem, I think. Oh, uh, can, can you uh, look up the Geor the state of Georgia flag from two thousand? Oh, okay, I'll find that. Uh, why are you doing that? Because that's another failed invented tradition. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I, because well, what's interesting? This uh, the Iraqi flag one was a uh, was a um, a kind of fail uh, was a failure, but not all in tra invented traditions that are invented by the colonial powers are a failure, and some of them do take in the countries uh, i mean part of the volume is talking about the colonial state and how it invented traditions i mean we're gonna have to get to that with scotland because we uh, we we mentioned the the hugh trevor roper article and like you know, kilts yeah as you were saying yes people wore uh tartan um they Sacks. basically they Sacks. basically wore tartan giant rugs that they tied together with belt um but you know it was almost a toga um but uh the standardization of that you know it, it is actually very much related to to um modern technological change if you go watch braveheart and you see those people wearing modern tartans you can't really make a uh, uh, a modern tartan easily in the in the time period of William Wallace, and because you kind of need um, industrial production to make tartans and pleats like that, like yeah, it, that. it it really is hard to do, um, <laughs> like by hand. People have and they but they didn't look that neat. They didn't look that modern. Their colors were not that crisp, etc. Oh, flag um, of, old flag of Georgia. Uh, yeah. Yep. Well, the, uh, there's another one that, that so it went. We had three flags in one year, so that's the old one. Uh, there's one where they actually try. Uh, there's a South Park episode that makes fun of this, um, and this you can tell is a failed invented tradition where they try. If you remember the South Park episode where they took down the flag that had the lynching on it and then put 
a, a flag that had all the flags, including the flag that had the lynching on it. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah that, uh, that's what they did. By the way, if if you think that's not a Confederate flag, that's just because you don't know anything. Yeah, that's, that's the Confe- real. That, that's yeah. the real deal. Confederate. That's flag, the right. Confederate peacetime flag. So that's how Georgia got away f- got away with it. Is they picked a Confederate flag no one knew, and including Georgians, and were like, uh, "Heritage, not hate." We're gonna get rid of the stars and bars because that's associated with hate. But we're gonna keep a Confederate flag. We're gonna fly the Confederate peacetime flag that was never flown. Which is not as cool as the Dukes of Hazard's flag. Yeah, yeah, no. The um, apart from the battle flag, which they're the bad guys, I know, but Germans had good uniforms. That's a pretty good flag, and um, all the other Confederate flags, dog shit. The um, they had one <laughs> called the Stainless Banner. Oh God, and so it was stupid. supposed to be white for the um purity of the white southern race <laughs> and of virginal womenhood uh, shall be on solid and so it was a white flag with a red bar yeah. at one but, end but and so, so it constantly looked like they were surrendering <laughs> so uh, say what you want about the confederacy though uh they at least fought the american imperialists right <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that joke to happen. Oh, uh, Mar- Marxism, Jacksonism is uh, probably a They thing. resisted the imperialists. Uh, yeah, they had problems. <laughs> National liberation. Oh, for you want to so- talk about oh, slavery? Jefferson Davis thought <laughs> you want, you want it was a very what? promising program. You want to talk mm. about you want to you want to talk about slavery? Well, what about here in New York City? We don't. You know, look at the police uh, brutality. All right, that's that's uh, enough, Baba, yes. Baba Jean. Because if you continue we'll to fi- do this, we will be fired. You will invent a tradition. Yes, we're gonna exactly. wake up tomorrow, and there's exactly. gonna be we know we'll do, gonna... the white guy Wednesday is gonna uh, be like Jesus. where we have Jesus. our discussions of uh, Jesus. We'll we'll have to find Mal a clan representative, a... right? Uh, like. <laughs> Ma- Mao- Maoism, da- uh, Davisism, you know, yeah, Mao's and Davis- 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 uh, which is about it's like, although uh, the Confederate States was a reaction regime, uh, no, it would they be Jefferson actually, Maoism. That sounds Jefferson a Maoism, lot better. Jefferson Maoism, and the theory is, although the Confederate States was a reactionary state, they were actually in the anti imperialist bloc because they were fighting against the dominant capitalist powers of the world, which included. The northern states of the United States, Great Britain and France, which ultimately sided with the Union. And they were left uh, uh, and suffered despite their problems. They were. So they were plus, they didn't like the market. They were the know? global south. They were the original global south. They broke with the idea of uh, wage slavery, right? Yeah, exactly. Actually, y- y- you, you, you say that, but. Uh... Hugh Fitzpatrick, who was this guy? Oh, I am aware. Yeah, <laughs> he made that argument. <laughs> That's a real Confederate argument yeah. that, like, uh, we're the real anti-capitalists because uh, slavery is not capitalism and frees everybody up from the burdens of the market. Uh, yes, it, freeze. It, yeah, I would uh, emphasize for, that. <laughs> it does Le mot juste, right? That's it does say precisely that, yeah. the word you were looking for. Hugh Fitzpatrick, the, he wrote uh, Sociology for the South. That's a crazy book. Um, what about this one? We've got, we've got, we've got, what about Calhounist Leninists? There we go. That's an... Yeah, Calhounism Leninism sounds, sounds pretty good. The, uh, 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 Twitter exists that if you keep saying it, there will be a, there will be a tendency. Oh, Streamer oh my will God. have picked it up and made oh my a God. deal within a week. All of the above, right? Could... The Calhounist <laughs> Leninists were the ones who launched the secession. Then, you know, like the Maoist, uh, the Jefferson Maoists were the, the ones fighting in the frontier. And yeah, they were the like... People's War. They were the People's War in bleeding Kansas. They were the... Uh... Exactly. They, they were the, the settler, uh, you know. So you guys going to accuse John Brown wait, of being a Wait, and how about this? Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and... They, they, the, uh, despite being based as a, a in settler colonial society, they allied with the indigenous uh, uh, 
the indigenous of Oklahoma to fight against Yankee imperialism. Actually, oh, I, 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 this is sort of an ugly part of U.S. history. The Confederates did have a better policy towards indigenous people than the Union did. Dun, 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 boom! <laughs> I think like, I, I think we need to we need to make it happen. We need uh, we need to but, start a but, whole left wing tendency. That, no, we don't. Yes, Dean, it will There's actually the, come into being. It, it'll be like <laughs> MAGA communism. Get out of town, man. Yeah, we, yeah. Has yeah. you done? You're Calhoun done dusted, Lennon is in. Calhoun Lennon is in. <laughs> exactly. Oh. You know, Nobody, uh, nobody wants to be like a whatever. What is a Hazite? What, are they a ha no? They want to be Calhounist, Leninist. That's the true MAGA communism <laughs> right there. Because you know, I, I, I'm going to give it to the Hask people. I want, I'm going to say this fine, and you may disagree. So you got the CP, CPUSA people, right? Who are, um, they're like, they like Stalin, but also they're like very socially liberal. You know, they, they like, they're on board with like diversity and different rights and you know different sexual orientation and things like that the hazites don't like any of that stuff yeah that's more in line with the marxist leninism, marxist leninism of joseph stalin than you know the cat boys cat boy stalinists yeah no it's I'm, true um the... I'm, I'm declaring has the true inheritor of Calhoun Leninism, uh, Stalinism, Stalinism, but no, we're the Calhoun Leninists, man. That's who we are. This is Calhoun Leninist. Oh, so we're floating a competing. We're we're fighting for that lane now. Yeah, if we if so we we're inventing a tradition so we can invent a an actual no. political ideology. We no, we we yeah, we we have to invent <laughs> traditions to oh, enforce no. the group ba bound, you know, the the group boundaries. Like we have to get them all to everybody who becomes a Calhoun Leninist has to like perform some kind of ritual every day to enforce their unity with us. And there also has to be a bunch of rituals surrounding Vaughn to like raise him up as like the leader of the community, like our king. Our sphere love. But, oh, oh, we got money. This yeah. podcast is an attempt to create a tradition that real Marxism and State Department Socialism Exciting. I didn't even. You can finish reading. No, he, it's it's. Uh, oh, it's Morlock. It's Morlock. Oh, it's Morlock. That's, that's what he does. That's what no, he does. That's what he does. We well, should he, be happy though because we've 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 accepted the true the the, the true inheritor of Joseph Stalin is Has. I'm 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 going with Has on it. All yeah. right. So back to inventor traditions. traditions. Let's go. Um, that was. Uh, Let's so, talk about let's talk let's talk about the Hugh Trevor Roper article. Okay? Yes, let's the Hugh Trevor Roper trouble. article, which is about the invention of Highland traditions. So you know when you go anywhere, even in the United States, there's so many Scotch Irish people. Lots of people talk about their tartan, talk about Scottish traditions, talk about the Highland Games, and even have an image of Scotland, which is dudes in kilts, maybe playing golf. I don't know. What would a Canadian or American think of when they think of Scotland? Um, the uh, bagpipes, obviously, bagpipes, bagpipes. kilts, um, the uh, a. I, I mean, this may have to do with uh, a kind of Polish um, transposed narrative, but the, they're scrappy people who fight for their independence and um, don't don't let the Brits roll them over. Um, I guess don't let the English roll them over. Um, the, I mean, in Canada, there's so much of Scotland here that, um, it might as well Scotia. be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all Nova Scotia, right? Haggis. Haggis is Scottish. That's like a tradition. Caber tossing. Caber tossing. That's the Highland games. The Highland games. Yeah. That's all kind of invented. There you go. Um, but um, Vaughn, do you want to talk a little bit about what uh, Hugh Trevor Roper is talking about in terms of this invention of tradition and why the image you will have, the tourist image you have in your mind of Scotland is basically a 19th century invention? Yeah, I mean, um, the Highland costume that he, th that he talks about, for example, which is like plaid, pillow bag, trues, shoulder belts, tartan, polycolored plaid, uh, they were they were forbidden under pain of death for a long time. Um, and then 
in the 19th century, they were more or less reinvented, brought back, but brought back as part of the Imperial military uniform guard. Mm-hmm. Um, and the clan tartans, which were previously banned and also not standardized, like this whole, like, clan you're, a, yeah, you're a Stuart, you get to wear the Stuart official tartans, except for the one claimed by uh, the royal house, because there's one Stuart carton that no one's supposed to be able to wear but the queen. But Challenge accepted. Yeah. Uh, all that stuff is really 19th century, and it's all tied into um, the standardization of military uniforms. So our image of that um, is is actually very, very modern. The uh, According to True Heaven Roper, by 1780, most of the things that the organic original forms of both of these things had not just been like outlawed, they'd been forgotten. Yeah, outlawed and forgotten. Like, not good. Um, and then they were brought back. And, and one of the interesting things, like, for example, uh, one of the open tartans, if you're into tartan culture, which... I kind of am. Um, it's a black watch tartan. Black watch tartan's pretty weird to be an open tartan because who are the black watch? Well, <laughs> yeah, they're literally a police force, kind of. Um, and and they're uh, they're Protestant sectarians, right? Yep they're they're, they're kind of a paramilitary police force for the Protestants uh, against the uh, Highland Catholics, and uh, they don't really come out. Uh, they don't really exist until the until the 1860s, but they're kind of where you see the standardization of a tartan, and it's actually from kind of bad anthropology. So part of it's based off this idea of the Celtic uh, peasantry wearing like bardic robes, and the bardic robes are actually loosely braced on Greek clothing. Um, and it, it, it's kind of an ensemble reinvented thing. Uh, interestingly, one of the first pr- people to really mass produce this stuff wasn't a Scotsman. It was a English Quaker making um, some, making good money out of it. Nothing, nothing builds your bank better than a good old fashioned invented tradition. Right. Yep. And, um, when the, the Highland Society, for example, which is really kind of formalized in 1778, um, it's formalized in London. You know, uh, most of our images of Highland culture come from Walter Scott. <laughs> like, it's, so that's very Victorian. Yeah, um, you, you know, like, and, and at this time of crisis, they were inventing traditions mm-hmm. left, right, and center. Also, <clears throat> and this is, um, I made a note for myself. Um, to get back to this point, the this way we can tie it back to materialism, um, the mode of cultural production and what you have available in terms of being able to, say, mass produce military uniforms or um, publish um, uh, Walter Scott novels is a factor for when it, um, the invention of tradition becomes what Matt Crisman calls a technology of governance, right? A, uh, an option that uh, political leadership could pursue. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter how um, devoted you might be to something like the cult of the emperor in Rome. Um, you didn't have certain technological avenues um, available to you. And what might be interesting now this is a, I forward this as a, a untested thesis, but um, has the fragmentation of technology and the in terms of the discourses that people can have uh, online and elsewhere, uh, the lack of uh, unified spaces or institutions where you could try to introduce a new invented uh, tradition are we have we overshot the nation state as the um, leading agent in um, this process to the point where it can be decentralized 
and fragmented down into smaller and smaller groups, like the Hazites. Or Wiccan. Somebody mentioned Wiccans, which is like a mm -hmm. we have subcultural invented traditions, um, which which have whole industries which support them. And, and I mean that's that's one of the things that makes this distinction a little bit interesting now, Gene. I mean, what do you make of this? Because uh one of the things that's really important about this is this is state or quasi state entities doing this. So these are people who, even if it's like the Highland Society, they're doing it under like royal imp imperator. Like, but once you get to the 20 to the 20th century, I think of uh, you mentioned war reenactment, but civil war reenactment like codifies a lot of stuff. There's not there's unlike the the statue thing and some of the the holidays, um, an actual better example of a, of a bunch of invented traditions that are tied to state level holidays are out here in the West. Like we have Pioneer Day, which is you know, well, I think Mormon I think Liberation Day, we, basically. We look but. at it. We look at. I mean, the huge of a rope article, and huge of a rope isn't like a Marxist or anything. No. Um, it shows that how the tradition is invented, the various people who adopted the various uh, reenactment societies and aristocrats who become fascinated with reviving this "quote unquote" authentic culture, and then of course the, a whole bunch of. Uh, economic factors and the fact that these tons get get mass produced and there's a business behind it i think when we look at the invention of tradition we see at least in the process of nation building uh we see the state obviously many states are taking the lead in creating these uh invented traditions but i think they can also emerge from civil society where, for example, you have emerging nationalist movements that are not state-bearing nationalist movements or that are not in political power. They might uh, seek to build national identity out without having control of state power through a civil society, through different, uh, you know, inventing all kinds of uh, traditions. So I don't think the state can be, is the, it's the main agency because states have to nation build, but at the same time, it's not the only agency. You can have civil society being involved. And to Kuba's point about the uh, technology, I think, I think, for example, in the U.S. and maybe I'm over diagnosing this, the increasing like apartheid within uh, American education between those who go to public school and those who go to some kind of charter or private school. Uh, means I think like there's a common national education and inculcation of political values that perhaps help build community that are no longer there. There isn't that shared experience. And so yeah. there is a certain dissolution, but I think that may be countered by other things. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, what I mean, it's interesting that you bring that up though, because like in, in the early part of the 20th century, I mean, we had a we had a lit literally apartheid school regime, like not a figurative one or right. a, a de facto one, both a de facto and a de jure one. And in the transition, like so many Southern states closed their entire public school system down, you know, like in the sixties and seventies, there were there were counties in southern states that just shut down the public schools altogether. Um, uh, so it's that wasn't made illegal till the uh, Supreme Court ruling in the and and, and a specific a specific application of the Civil Rights Act uh, in in the mid seventies. So we've never like the, the United States is kind of weird because we've not had this except in a couple of there like Thanksgiving's the example of I can think of it being led by the state, but most of our stuff kind of isn't led by the state or it's led by it's led by state, not the federal level actors. Um, there's a whole lot of invented tradition and like um, uh, state level education programs and the large states set them. So Texas, New York, California, uh, to some degree Florida, set the textbook rules. And you have like the conservative state textbooks. They all kind of match up with Texas because it's the biggest market. Um, and so you have that form too. Uh, it's, I'm trying to think of like, 
invented traditions that are explicitly um, state-led in the United States and other than Thanksgiving, I, the flag codes are? Yeah, uh, the national anthem. Citizenship like, yeah. ceremonies. Citizenship, Citizenship yeah. ceremonies. Yeah, there's, yeah. All ki- there's all kinds of little things. Uh, I mean, like, yeah, you the you have to pledge allegiance in the citizenship thing. There's some words you need to do. Uh, also, the entire border entry process. Although I suppose that's more custom than that's that's yeah, that's, 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 that's more, custom and law. <clears throat> yeah, uh, but but I think when we look at when we look around, we you know we can even see like within relative recent memory, a state uh, singing the national anthem. At sports games, oh yeah, you still see it, but it was a it was not a thing oh, until um, it was it's a relatively new thing. But it's it, yeah, it was the, internalized as a tradition, and it was state sponsored. That's like the, a pretty the military. The military shows during um, major sporting events. Yep, yeah, which which now kind of only happen with NASCAR, but but yeah, um, it, it, you, that's all kind of new too. I'm trying to think of some other ones. A lot of Fourth of July traditions are this way. Um, yeah, and in Britain, they're all trying. That there, there's all these kind of. I guess I, I think Britain is seeing in the post Brexit world a whole bunch of like English nationalist things, which are being. There's a whole furore now about like St George's Day, and you know that needs to be the national holiday. Uh, they want the uh you know they want to they want to create new vectors for an english identity that is distinct from the british identity but because there's been such a historical overlap between those identities we are uh you know we're basically kind of uh, seeing a new wave of inventing traditions precisely because the pace of historical change in Britain is taking place and the powers that be need to reinforce group identity and reinforce hierarchy. You only adopted the darkness. I was born into it. Yeah. I, by it. I think this gets us to the criticisms of this book. Uh, one of the criticisms that's often thrown at this book by anthropologists is like, Actually, the the kind of obvious question we got: What's it? What aren't our traditions invented? And and also, there's a, there is a looseness to the concept mm-hmm. of invented traditions because, as we said, some of these are real customs, real genuine traditions that get they get reappropriated and given new ritualized meaning through like semi formal or formal standardization, often encouraged by the state. But as we're talking about here, we get into a really murky area about what state, non-state, and parastate actors are. Like, because even in the, the we're just sticking to one of these essays, the Roper essay, because it's relatively simple, these get more complicated. But um, it's, uh, how do I say this? Um, it It's hard to see what's unique about invented traditions to the modern world, except the sheer level of their availability and ease of producing them. And also and, frequency. Yeah. Frequency. And frequency. Yeah. But it does see like, in a way we were talking about, this as like an alternative theory to, uh, you know, of nationalism or of national, of nation state formation. But when you kind of look at it, you're like, well, this isn't that different than Benedict Anderson. Like this, because you you need the books and you need mass commercial culture for it to be viable. Yeah, I think that there's a room for a synthesis here, and we shouldn't treat these uh, theories as as necessarily mutually exclusive. Well, they're doing different things, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, they're doing the invention of tradition is trying to understand like a specific process of how how and why all these traditions are presented as traditional when in fact they're not traditional and what does that tell us what does that mean and the invention of tradition is a rubric under which to understand that so that's not you know that's doing a different task from anderson who's trying to put forward a grand theory of nationalism yeah um so 
I think that's interesting. I mean, it, it is interesting. I guess we have to talk about Hobbes Swam's uh, actual grand theory of naturalism because he's got two whole books on it. Uh, one from 20, one that was published posthumously in 2021. Although and, two whole books sounds like next time. On yeah, we're not talking Edwin's about it today. Case. Yeah, no, we're not doing that today. We, we, um, uh, so and then there's the big nationalism book, which which I have not reread and thus cannot immediately in my head relate to this volume. Uh, this is just a volume. When, when Gene and I were talking about this, I mentioned this because I used this a lot when I was doing my Korean, uh, Koreanist research. Well, I think um, it's, I think for people doing historical analysis, it is a, <clears throat> it's a useful concept as it serves as a useful tool because, you know, an invented tradition, just because something's invented doesn't make it good or bad. Right. Right. We're just trying to understand the purpose of why something is invented. I think sometimes people uh, get defensive on this issue of invented tradition as if it, there's a normative adjustment into, in them because there is a kind of falsity in them because they're presenting themselves as having an organic tie to the past when they don't have that organic tie or that they've been, or the organic tie is incidental to the function mm -hmm. that they're serving. And uh, so I think people, but it's neither a good or a bad thing. It's just something to, I think this is a very quote unquote sociological or anthropological piece of history writing. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the other thing is to put it, even though he talks about genuine tradition and custom, you know what he doesn't use? He doesn't ever throw around the word authentic. Right. Um, authenticity is not at play here because even in genuine custom, you probably have what we, what, you know, sociologists and, and folklorists might call fake lore, um, uh, which is all these tales we tell ourselves about this or that, that we think is true. Like every, like every idiom has one. Uh, the one that comes to mind is rule of thumb. That's completely fake. That's fake lore. Um, there was no law about beating your spouse with a rod thinner than your thumb. That never existed. Um, we don't know the idiomatic origin of rule of thumb. We just have no idea where it comes from. Um, so it, it, we have a lot of, there's a lot of fake lore out there. Um, and that ties into invented tradition too. Some of these are actually like formally picked up by the state um, and used uh like for example when i went to school i was always taught georgia was was proud to be a confederate state but it also was reluctant to be a confederate state robert e lee only became a confederate general when there was no other choice and georgia we only left the union after those dirty south carolinans did um they tricked us yeah basically <laughs> Kuba, thoughts? Um, the I actually I'm going to repeat a question that's in uh, super chat. JB was asking. Um, I'll skip the superfluous uh, compliments. Um, are the Hobbeswam nationalism books worth reading? Um, and he's already read. Uh, they've already read. Uh, Imagine the communities. The uh, nations and nationalism uh, is a good book, um, and Hobbeswam. He provides a good overview of the topic. There's certain things that I might disagree with, in at least in the way that he frames things. But definitely, the Hobbesbaum book is really good. The Nations and Nationalism one would be the one I would recommend that you read. As that's the the main one that was published during his lifetime. Lifetime. Yeah. But there's also there is also some useful chapters in the I think in the Age of revolution age of capital and age of em uh, empire uh, volumes as well there are chapters about you know the changing nature of nationalism over the course of the 19th and 20th century read the recent the most recent on nationalism book that's just a collection of his essays going all the way back i think to the to the 50s on i haven't read i haven't read the new one yeah i haven't read it i haven't read it either i'm sure i've actually read a couple of the essays in it um, well, Hob Hobbesborn's book is very in influenced by Miroslav Hosh. Yeah, who, who we are eventually going to do. Yeah, who um, will do Miroslav Hosh because uh, he's, I think, I, I find him one of the most useful uh, 
writers on nationalism, but we'll come back to that at a later date. But yeah, like I would definitely recommend people if you can get a copy of the uh, Invention of Tradition uh, collected essays. They're actually all good essays. Um, you know, there's the one about uh, Scotland. There's one about Wales, which is actually an example of where you have a kind of cultural movement that that helps in reinvent uh, Welsh culture and history. Uh, so, you know, that's a good volume as it has a good number of examples uh, of inventor traditions. Uh, there's a good article you can get on JSTOR by Salem Derengel, uh, called the, uh, which is about the invention of tradition in the Ottoman Empire. So things like the fez that you associate with the Ottoman Empire was like a perfect example of an invented tradition. The Sultan wanted to uh, get make rid a of hat the, that everybody could wear. Like. Where, 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 make a hat that, so that everyone could wear, and would that would break down the differences between the various sectarian groups in the Ottoman Empire because different sectarian groups had different sartorial traditions, and so it was very apparent who was a, a Muslim, who was a Christian, and who was a Jew. The Fez uh, was an attempt by the Ottoman state to create a national hat, a yep. project that was picked up, for example, in Iran in the 1930s with the Pahlavi cap, where they made everyone wear like a French police hat as the national hat. Uh, so when the Fez, the irony is, the Fez was abolished as the national hat in Turkey uh, because it was too associated with the Ancien Regime and it was seen as a sign of backwardness and uh, medieval barbarity, when in fact it was like a example like the Ching of, Q. Of, of a, like the Ching Q as well. Yeah, exactly. Do you want to tell us about the Ching Q? The uh, Qing Dynasty, the final, um, the final one to rule Imperial China, was actually Manchu, who were a mm -hmm. um, nomadic uh, horse people, uh, yeah. similar to Mongolians from the yeah. northeast. Mongolians, they're 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 the Mountain. bridge culture between Mongolians and Koreans traditionally. Like, there you go. And um, they stressed their uh, foreign heritage, and they had the habit of um, braiding their hair in long queues, which had symbolic meaning in their culture. Once they established themselves, every man had to grow one, and it became one of the markers that foreigners associated with Chinese, even though it wasn't even Chinese and they were only doing it under the duress of this non-Chinese occupying people. Um, then one day, as soon as, as soon as they were able, um, everyone cuts off their cues um, when the, when the Qing dynasty finally falls. Yeah, it's, <laughs> The, these uh, the, these are actually quite quite interesting. The, the funny thing about like Jewish tradition is the kippah, you know, the yarmulke, whatever. That in and of itself is a relatively modern like uh, tradition thing. And then you see a lot of the ha and, and again these are these are quasi minute traditions. They're not they're not what Hasbam means, but they are uh, they are kind of national unifiers where you have these interpretations of Jewish uh, sumptuary law, uh, you know, uh, Kashrut law about clothing. And if you, you see the Hasidim, it's all seemingly based off 19th century Poland. Even when they're in Israel, everyone's wearing the big wool suits that you would have worn in 19th century Poland. Like, but the 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 kaput uh, that is also relatively modern because it was it was culturally neutral, as opposed to just because the actual rule about covering your head is just cover your head in the you know whatever the wear a baseball local, cap, yeah, whatever the local culture is, cover your head that way. Don't show your hair to God when you're praying. So you know the the kaput's like this this like well wear a skull cap. Uh, yeah, it's going to make you look distinctive. It's going to stand you out as a Jew, but it's also not going to stand us out from each other. Um, that's kind of a modern thing. So, yeah. All right. I'm going to need to go soon because the lighting is changing and uh, my face will soon be visible. Oh, no. Yes. That can't be. 
You can't have that. You must keep. If your you doctor. want that, then yeah, you spring for the membership and join us in the champagne room. So yes. Cuba can afford lights. It's tough times. Yes. Uh, well, you know, we have been going for a while. Uh, so I think we have covered a good discussion on the invention, t- invention of tradition. It's still available. You can still get a copy of that book quite easily. There are a lot of uh, historians um, uh, I know who have used that comp- uh, concept to apply it to different uh, countries and different uh, nation states. So there's a lot of work out there based on this idea of invention of tradition. And, uh, you know, I would definitely recommend p- people pick up the collected uh, uh, volume. Hobsbawm, you know, obviously was a Marxist. He was a member of the Communist Party of Great Britain. Uh, Lifelong, I believe. Life, Yeah, well, a long time he was involved in the Communist Party. Um, but the, a lot of the other historians involved in this project aren't. So that's a quite interesting range of styles and it ends with Hobsbawm's essay on the period between 1870 and 1914 which is like the the uh, high season of inventing traditions yeah so uh anything guys to plug before we go kuba what do you have to plug um you- i'll have a um an interview with uh, Doug Lane, um, a d- discussion about free speech that uh, should be out on sublation um, pretty soon, whenever he gets to that place in the stack. And um, Varn uh, and I, together with our fabulous moderator, Jordan Dubin, um, have a couple of uh, episodes on um, class theory that yeah. um, we've recorded and will come out. Yep, non marks of class theory. They start in about two weeks and they're going to go for every week for a while, actually, because we keep on realizing that that uh, Jordan's initial outline that we were somehow going to do in an hour is basically uh, a course syllabus. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> so. you got to do it all. You gotta, <laughs> you're having a teach in. Anything else exciting <laughs> on Van Vlog? Um, we have interviews coming out from Mike McManus, uh, Ryan Zetgraf, um, uh, a separate series that Jordan and I are doing. Uh, let me see. Oh, oh, uh, gl- um, Pro Cult Films and I have stuff coming out on the re- on the revisionist controversies context between Bernstein and Kalski. So there's historical stuff and another episode on why Trotskyism died in the United States, um, even though some of it's still alive. But all, all the Trotskyist stuff that's still alive is actually British. Uh, so. British of Trotskyists. Um, <laughs> talking about Trotskyists, I uh, uh, they're, they're having a get together in Springfield, the PSL, who the kind of Trotskyists, right? On, on the PSL, Trotskyists, no, they were, but they don't they don't mention their origins anymore. Oh, they that they're uh, crypto Trotskyists, yeah, uh, their origins have extend into the shady hazy mists of time Ooh. yeah who yeah, can know the, who can even know? though they were founded in 2004 but yes yes um yeah uh, uh yeah they they uh they're anti-revisionist now so you don't mention their marcy origins because uh well you can mention marcy but you can't mention that marcy was a trotskyist so shh. ah, you got, you got you got to flip it all. You got to flip it all around. Uh, that's Remember, tight. you didn't hear it. He- uh, you didn't hear it here. Right? <laughs> yeah. If uh, anybody so- asks, it's like some revolutionary blackout gossip. Oh yeah. no, no, we don't. We we're not getting into that. They're gonna they're gonna get us. You know, I don't want to get getted by mixed martial uh, be arts. Man. This is this is White Guy Wednesday. So exactly, uh, you know yeah, we. we- we're we're the reactionary antimatter, I no, guess. We <laughs> counter revolutionary whiteout. That's what, <laughs> that's what we should call ourselves. There we go. Counter revolutionary whiteout. There um, and then and then and this is where Kuba recites the 14 words and we sign off. Um, everyone have a very good night. 
Um, I, you only adopted the darkness. Um, and it's all, it's all code. It's all code. It's all, all lives code. matter, I guess. All, all lives I mean, matter. Oh, there we go. That's our slogan. Amen. Well, um, I, I, I've, uh, I did an interview with a, a young gentleman from Iran. He has a channel with his friend and it's called, um, it's called, it's a progressive world. So that'll be coming soon. And also I was on the Antifada where we talked about Hull. They tricked me. They said, well, let's talk about something serious. And then they ended up asking about Hull. What's going on in Hull? What's the latest tricks at the bonus arena? You know, I was super upset. I missed War of the Worlds. That had was being the War of the Worlds musical. But, so you, you got asked to talk about Turkey, but you ended up talking about Chavs. Yeah. Ch what's a Chav? Chavs. 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 Whatever. Know. Whatever. Okay, well, guys, uh, with that I'm... blathering aside, as we say here on White Guy Wednesday, long live the great state of Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Stalin was from Georgia. No. Yes, Stalin was. Oh, that's what we need. That's the, That has to be the symbol for White Guy Wednesday, like a Confederate yeah. flag with a hammer and sickle. No, yeah, like, no, you replace the constitution and justice <laughs> thing with Stalin's face. Yes. With the, with the red laser eyes. No. The dark Brandon eyes. We have, we have like, we have uh, Marx, Lenin, uh, Marx, Jefferson Angles. Davis. Jefferson Davis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah Jeff uh, Robert E. Lee. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and we, we'll they create the doctrine of uh, the anti-imperialist resistance of the Confederate state. Well, it was a poor, poor, largely peasant country with some barbaric <laughs> practices that was insult, uh, assaulted by an industrial imperialist it, power. It I had mean, a I, long I just, history of multiracial coexistence. Exactly, it was different. Like, but we don't want to impose racist European liberal universalism on the people of the Confederate States of America. It was a, you know, they were fighting for a multipolar uh, North, North America. North America, precisely. Exactly, exactly. multipolar. Break I mean, the Anglo-American hegemony. Exactly. The cooperation between the duopoly, <laughs> the Atlantic duopoly. This was, you know, their traditional practices were under threat, right? Oh. Like, I'm not saying they're perfect. I'm not saying they're mm. perfect. Yeah, they're they're ancestral communitarian settlements. Exactly. Right? The things weren't commercialized, you know, and godless. <laughs> yeah, they they wouldn't vulgarly um, assign uh, some kind of price tag to an hour's worth of labor. <laughs> exactly. They <laughs> assigned a price tag to the entire human being. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's a more holistic notion of value. Exactly. And, you know, they had to fight against the war crimes of Sherman and, you know. Oh, thing, yes. Uh, that Butcher Grant, right? The Butcher Grant. Look at that. It's, that suffered under these barbaric uh, so-called liberal interventionists. There we exactly. go. Exactly. A proto-NATO. I think you're yeah, proto-NATO. Exactly. It's uh, Calhounism. That's It's Leninist Calhounism. This will exist within the week. Thanks, guys, for unleashing another dark force upon the world. No, Lenin's uh, Cal Calhounism is is. Uh... Oh my god! Oh my god! Uh, it's not a political ideology or an internet trend. It's a southern food, fast food chain. <laughs> oh. I'm more thinking like I'm imagining Leninist Calhounism. Like it's gonna look like shining path, but with more <laughs> cowboy hats <laughs> and pickup trucks. That's what I'm it's gonna be about. It's shining path. It's gonna be the shining actual path. southerner is terrified right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like uh, the Confederate States the fight the people's oh, war. A oh people's my god! War. And you're going to you're going to have like existing Aryan biker gangs and clan chapters. Pledging allegiance to um, Calhoun Leninism. Yeah, the People's Democratic 
Republic. Oh, oh they do it like oh, like Dixie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We we do this like the, the masses guys, right? What, what yeah. was their thing? No, no. Kalfunu must... Akbar. No. What would they would have? What would be... they would need a slogan? We have to we have to think about this a lot more because I think. Um... I think we need to think about this a lot less, actually. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I'm just, I, I'm now like, Gene, Gene, stop. Gene, like, this will exist. Be careful. Yeah, you're, 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 you're developing a LARPing. Um, I want to, I, I like, kind of want to, I kind of want to get off the show, set up a, 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 a sock puppet account, and start fighting. With, As from. Them. No, f- start fighting anyone who is a, like craves oh, you, the you union like chris morlock no he likes he i'm sure he likes all those guys i'm sure he's he, he oh, likes the on. union all right we're going to step away step away uh, from the but yeah no I, I and i can go around and argue the case of the progressive uh the confederacy with the progressive wing of the american civil war it's like the logical endpoint of uh Third worldism, right? Yeah, I, and you could get um, America. You could get a column at uh, the American Conservative. I wonder yeah, if I could, you probably could actually. That would be amazing. Like, create a persona, uh, and try oh, and, my, get, and then okay, and Gene, then have Gene, have that column argue happened. with you in compact. Yeah, in exactly. Real life. This has happened in real. I know life. there was that Iranian fake guy writing Iranian art, uh, articles As about that, Iran. Like, yeah, uh, he was a young woman in Aleppo, right? I don't know exactly. It was, but it was. There was also like what the anti woke professor who was a former Marxist, actually a guy I was writing a book with at one point, who created a fake troll account, but eventually actually started believing his own nonsense and ended up on Bill O'Reilly and Tucker Carlson. Wait, is that who was that, that one? The Titania, the... Michael Renwald. Oh no! I don't know that guy. Um. Anyway, so be very careful because this stuff does happen. Yeah, no, uh, no. Hey. I, I, I think that um, <laughs> Nadia in the chat, right? She's she's echoing your your caution here, and I, I think Jean, maybe maybe we'll we'll let the voice of reason carry. Um, <laughs> All right. Jeez. Well, guys, with that on that beautiful sentiment, we are out. <laughs>